Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back here with you. Today, uh, we'll be talking on this live Facebook feed on how many times should people be prepared to do IVF? How many times is enough? How many times is too much? When should you stop? And that really is going to be the subject of this presentation today. Uh, before I start, let me again say that you can reach me anytime if you'd like to have a Skype consultation with me by going directly to my concierge lady, Julie Dahan, and calling her at 702-533-2691. 702-533-2691. You can also access me by going directly to my website, which is shareivf.com shareivf.com and you'll find an enrollment form there. All you have to do is fill in that form and it will be forwarded to Julie and she'll set up a consultation for you. Alternatively, you can email Julie, Julie directly at Julie, J-U-L-I-E D, Julie D at shareivf.com Now on my blog, you'll also find numerous articles that I've written if you go to the home page of the blog, and you can get to it by going to the website, shareivf.com, and then you'll find a little horizontal banner. In that banner, you'll find a little uh, a section that says Dr. Sher's blog. Click on that, and when you get to the blog, all you have to do is type into the little search bar the title of any issue that you want to get more information on, and that'll take you directly to the articles that are relevant. Okay, so let's get started. Firstly, let me say that it's not likely, with few exceptions, that a woman will have a baby with more than a 50% chance when she does IVF. It doesn't matter who you are. The one exception might be cases where we do IVF with egg donation. And perhaps one other constant... Uh, exception might be where we use genetic testing of embryos to identify those that are most competent and most likely to propagate a baby. Of course, with all other cases, you have to anticipate that it may take more than one attempt. And so it's very unwise for anyone to start doing IVF until you're ready and willing to consider the possibility of failure as well as the possibility of success and plan for both. I always say the bucket half full is the better approach. The glass half full rather than the glass half empty. But guarded optimism is the way you should go forward, not blind optimism. And so if you look at the overall success rates with IVF in the very best IVF centers, you'll note that for women in their 30s who have fertile male partners, the chance of a baby from a single chance of IVF, or let's first say the chance of a pregnancy occurring, is probably around 40-45%, maybe a little higher in some cases. But the chance of a baby being born, if you take into consideration chemical pregnancies and miscarriages where you can lose them, is probably around 35-40% to 40 from one fresh attempt at in vitro fertilization. Today, frozen embryo transfers give basically the same or even perhaps even a slightly better chance of success than fresh because we can better prepare the uterine lining to receive the embryo when we give hormonal treatment to prepare it than when we sim simply rely on the ovaries and the hormones that it puts out. Oftentimes the mixture, the combination is not optimal. So fresh and frozen embryo transfers can be viewed as giving an equal chance of success. But not everybody's going to produce enough embryos for more than one try. It very much depends on your age. It depends upon the cause of the infertility. But most importantly, it's going to depend on the, on the ovarian reserve, how many eggs the woman's got left. And that we measure by doing an AMH, anti-Mullerian hormone test, any time in the cycle. But if we get to put back at least one or two blastocysts, then the overall chance of a woman having a baby 
within three comprehensive IVF attempts, and please let me define this clearly. That means as many egg retrievals and embryo transfers, oh, so let me go back, as many egg retrievals and embryo transfers that will result from an attempt. In other words, if you do one egg retrieval, but there are enough embryos to do two additional transfers aside from the fresh transfer in that particular cycle, that compromise comprises one comprehensive attempt. And if you get access to th up to three IVF attempts, then women in their 30s should certainly have about 80 to 85 percent chance of giving birth to a baby. And we get to this number by what we call a regression analysis. A hundred women go in, 35 roughly end up having a baby from the first attempt. Roughly half will have enough embryos to try yet another attempt. And then of those that try a second time, another 35% of those will have a baby. And some will even have a chance to do a third attempt. And 35% of those that have that opportunity will have a baby. So that within one comprehensive attempt, the overall chance of a baby may be higher than 35%. It may be 40 to 45% of having a baby, but within three such comprehensive attempts, over 85% will have a baby. For women in their 40s, that number is roughly halved, halved across the board. And as I said earlier, it's probably much higher in cases of IVF with egg donation or IVF when we only replace embryos that have been genetically tested through pre-implantation genetic screening, PGS. And so selectively we put back only those that are the most competent. So those are the numbers, and this explains why it's important to have a very clear perspective of what you're getting into when you do IVF. Now, there are certain things that make the chance of success greater or less. I've already identified two important ones. The one is the age of the woman, because that's going to impact the quality of her eggs. And the other one is going to be her ovarian reserve. How many eggs are left? And the third in her ovaries. And the third one, of course, is going to be the competency of the husband's sperm. Of course, there's another fourth one, which you have to add on. And that's the competency of the center that you're going to. How good is the laboratory? How good are the doctors and the people providing the service? Because certainly the protocol used for ovarian stimulation is a critical factor in determining the quality of the eggs that you ultimately harvest and therefore the quality of the embryos available for transfer. It's also important to bear in mind that unless you look very closely at the factors that affect both the quality of the embryo, therefore that goes back primarily to the egg, and then the receptivity of the uterine lining. You have to look at both of them, where the embryo represents the seed you're planting, and the lining, the soil in which you're planting that seed. You have to have a receptive soil, and you also have to have a competent seed. You can't put a good seed in a bad soil, or a bad seed in a good soil. And then the person planting the seed, the doctor doing the transfer of the embryos to the uterus, has to A, plant the seed in the right season. That means there has to be ideal circumstances created to do the transfer and has to do it delicately and with precision. If you do all those things, you have an optimal setting. But it will differ from center to center because everybody needs to bear in mind going into IVF that it is much more complex than people recognize. And it's very important to see it as a art science blend. There's a scientific aspect which you need to be aware of and you need to practice in the doing of IVF, but then there's the art side and they have to blend together to give you a good result. And so when you select a program and you look at success rates, always take into consideration the factors I mentioned. It's not going to be successful every time the first time you try. It may take two or three attempts and that will vary with the age of the woman, her ovarian reserve, the, the, the quality of the man's sperm, and the quality of the IVF program, and the experience and seasoning of the doctor producing or performing the procedure. Now, there are several issues that come into play when it comes to this as well. And that is, 
if you keep putting embryos of the best quality into a uterus that is non-receptive, you'll not get a baby. And that's where things like immunologic competence of the uterine lining play a role. We spoke about this before. We have to test women where there's a predisposition for immunologic implantation dysfunction, such as women that have had repeated losses, repeated unexplained IVF failures, women with endometriosis, women who've got a personal or family history of immune disorders like lupus erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis or hypothyroidism, all of which can be associated with the immunologic prejudice to the embryo you're putting in the uterus. And that has to be carefully evaluated and properly addressed and treated as I've put in my blogs that I've posted and also in one or more of these previous feeds on the issue of implantation. Also the thickness of the lining needs to be good. It can't be less than eight millimeters. I never put embryos into a uterus with the thickness of the lining on the day of the egg retrieval or the day of the transfer, sorry, or the day of maximal estrogen preparation for a frozen transfer is less than eight millimeters. Because you're going to get bad results. And if you get a pregnancy, that pregnancy is probably either not going to hold or it's going to be associated with poor nurturing of the growing embryo and you're going to end up with a, with a, a baby that doesn't develop as healthily as it could. Remember, the objective of what we do is not to just get a pregnancy at any cost. Our objective is to get a healthy baby that has optimal potential for subsequent intellectual and physical development after birth and contribution to life. So this is where we're headed. And when we keep these things in mind, it's important to bear in mind that when you do the transfer to the uterus, that the, uterine, that the uterus's receptivity, the implantation process, is in place. When it comes to the embryos and their competency, there are many ways to determine that. Obviously, an embryo, the fertilized egg, that fails to develop in five to six days to the advanced blastocyst stage development, where it's over 100 cells, is almost always genetically chromosomally incompetent. And you don't want it anyway. And that's why it's my policy to only put back embryos that are able to demonstrate an ability to reach the expanded blastocyst stage by no later than day six. You can take it a step further because even those embryos that make it aren't necessarily normal. They, of course, are the ones more likely to be normal. If you start with ten eggs, you may end up only with two or three blastocysts. But it, and that is because many of those that were abnormal were lost or culled out along the way. So putting back the blastocysts gives you the best potential for uh, having chosen the right embryo based upon its appearance. But beyond its appearance, you need to realize that embryos can look perfect, and yet at the same time, they can be genetically or chromosomally abnormal. And that's where this process of doing chromosomal testing of the embryo, or we what we call karyotyping, or what I referred to earlier on as PGS, can be done. Today, we use a method known as next-generation gene sequencing for identifying the best possible blastocysts. Those are the most potential. And those are the ones we selectively put back. So what we then do is we stimulate the woman, remove her eggs, fertilize them, and when they reach the blastocyst stage, we biopsy the embryos. And we send away the DNA for testing. This allows us to tell which ones are the best quality and the most likely to make a baby. Now, the older a woman gets and the lower her ovarian reserve becomes, the less likely it is that we're going to get enough embryos to, to, to warrant doing the transfer. We may not even get any that meet, meet the test of being perfectly chromosomally normal. And in those cases, all we can do is repeat the IVF retrievals to try to stockpile and collect more embryos over time. We, give, we stimulate the woman, we remove the eggs, we make the embryos, we biopsy the embryos. And if none of them make it to blastocyst, we go on and skip a month and do another cycle. And the goal is to try to get at least six blastocysts before we test them all once by having biopsied them in advance and have kept the biopsied 
DNA material, we then can send them all away for a single test and save the financial cost of having to do the genetic testing over and over. We call this embryo banking or stockpiling and selectively placing back embryos that are PGS normal. If we use that approach, we get better results. But here's a word of caution. This type of process of doing PGS, PGS testing is not necessary for everyone. It's only for women that are older where the number or percentage of eggs that are going to be normal is less, and therefore the percentage of embryos are going to be less. Or for women with unexplained repeated IVF failure. Or for women that uh, we know are predisposed to certain chromosomal abnormalities. So it's wrong, in my opinion, to use this expensive additional testing in all women simply because it gives you uh, uh, a better ability to select the good ones. In a young woman, one out of every two blastocysts is going to be normal anyway. Why not just put in two? And you've got just as good a chance as if you'd put in a normal one. So in my opinion, PGS testing is overused at the moment. Some programs do it on everybody, and I think it's wrong. I think it needs to be done only on those people where it's medically indicated. So this gives you an overview of the whole issue of how many times should you try. In summary, you've got to go into it expecting, hoping that you only, can, that you only need one attempt, but expecting that in the majority of cases it's going to take more than one attempt. And in cases where you're not going to, where there's a, a prejudice as to the quality of the eggs, you've got to then consider doing the genetic testing through PGS that I mentioned. If you take a rational approach to entering into an, the IVF journey, and you think about it this way, you'll save a lot of heartache. It's far better to know what you're getting into than to go in blindly with the expectation, oh, it's just bound to work, or to be given false promises and then have false expectations. I hope you find this helpful. And again, if you're interested in talking to me about your particular case, please contact Julie either by email, and I gave you the information before, or via my website by enrolling there uh, and or by uh, simply calling her at 800-780-7437. Uh, that is, sorry, that number is, is the number that will reach her. For those of you that live out of country and won't be able to reach her at the 800 number, those of you in Canada or outside the United States anywhere, can reach her at 702-533-2691. Thank you and have a wonderful day.